one more uh, gospel lesson before we get into today's message. This is a passage that we read at the beginning of Lent this past year. It, Mark has a very short version. He doesn't give the detail, but, and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Um, everybody know for want of a nail? Remember this old, this old thing? For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For the want of a message, the battle was lost. For the want of a, for the, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horse shoe nail. I, I guess you would call that a, 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 a proverb. Uh, not a religious proverb, but it, but it has a message about how something small or that seems small and insignificant can mushroom into something much larger and, shall we say, much more costly. Proverb, not, a, not in the Bible, but it, it, it has a lot of truth. Um, the old one about the cover-up and the lie, which brings to mind, you know, two, two, you know, two, two ideas. Watergate and blue dress. Um, the nail that leads to much more trouble. Well, in, in today's story as we begin to encounter David and Bathsheba, we have not a, not a literal nail, but we have a figurative nail. And we can call it David's lust, or we can call it temptation. But it's, it's the nail without which the story of David and Bathsheba just wouldn't take place. Um, it's a great story. And it's a great story with at least one meaning that just, it doesn't quite jump off the pages. But it's every time we've encountered this story, I, I've tried to give this message. And, and I, owe, I, I owe my being able to see it to uh, one of the few times I can remember what another preacher once had to say. And this was John Buchanan of Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. If we look at what David has done in the passage that Rose read, he's committed adultery and he's conspired to commit murder. Okay. Yet God loves David. God has not renounced the promise God made last week of a house. Remember we talked about a house as being a, like a dynasty. Okay. The house of David is going to experience a lot of difficulties uh, in coming weeks, if you will. Um, even involving the death of a son. And that, that should give us pause because, because the son is innocent. It's David who's being punished. And yet God does not renounce God's promise. God does not renounce David despite his sins. God does not renounce me despite my sins. And God does not renounce any of you. And I don't want to be presumptuous in saying most of you probably have sins as well. God does not renounce them. Um, of course, the interesting thing is, is the, the, the sin, uh, the, the, the nail that leads David to sin is, is temptation. David gives in to this, this incredible temptation when he sees this woman bathing. And indeed, there is a, you know, she becomes pregnant. And the cover-up is... He, you know, it's so clever with what Rose read. You know, David, the, Uriah comes back from battle. There's a reason David wants Uriah to go home, okay? So that, so that Uriah will ultimately believe that the child that is being carried by Bathsheba is his, and, and, and Uriah spoils the plot. So the rest of the cover-up is, is David arranges that Uriah is going to be killed in battle. It's horrible. It's murder. Temptation. Temptation ultimately 
is what led him to those. Um, you know, in a, we're going to experience temptation. But there's a particular type of temptation. You know, in a, in a few words, in a few moments, from rote memory, we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer. And what are we going to say? Lead us not into temptation. But there is, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I think you all know that Jesus did not speak Greek. Jesus spoke a language called Aramaic. It's still spoken by a few people up in the, uh, up in the area of Nineveh in Iraq, and some of them were in this country. But Greek is the best we have. And the oldest version, the original version, as far as you can tell, of the Lord's Prayer is to be found in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. Where the Greek word used is the same stuff. My goodness, it should. When I look at it on paper, it's in Greek. But anyway, the Greek word is perosmo. Perosmo. But it isn't, it isn't necessarily properly translated, it's hard to say, as temptation. Or in, in my default translation of the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, Jesus says in the, in the Lord's Prayer, and do not bring us to the time of trial. Time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Okay. Time of trial, hmm, it has a, it has a little bit more impact to it. Now this word, perosmo, doesn't appear much in the Bible, but it appears in two of the epistles. Uh, its definition in the Greek dictionary is to try to learn the nature or character of someone or something by submitting such to thorough and extensive testing. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul uses the word, and the way it's translated in English is, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? And in the epistle that's known as 1 Peter, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Time of trial. Well, not all temptations are so bad. Not all temptations are a time of trial. And by time of trial, I'll explain a few moments, I mean when we give up and turn away from God. Um, if, not that any of you would do this, if any of you are tempted by the last chocolate chip cookie at Fellowship and take it, it might not be good for your health, or your waistline, your dentist might love it. Um, it may not be fair to me because I might want that cookie. But it is not a time of trial. It, your faith isn't called into question. But in the story of the temptation that David faces, why his and our faith and the tenets thereof are called into question. It is a time of trial. I mean, if, if we can believe the biblical timetable, the Ten Commandments are given more than 200 years before David comes on the throne. So David knows fully well that he has committed adultery and violated the Seventh Commandment. Not to say that he hasn't violated the Sixth Commandment against murder in what he does later on with respect to, to, to uh, Uriah. Now, time of trial. And, and despite this, it's fascinating that God does not give up. This, this causes lots of trouble for the house of David. And I hope I haven't said this already including the death of a child, which should trouble us because the child is innocent. It's punishment of David. Yet God never reneges on the promises that God makes. God does not renege on the promise that God makes to David, nor to me, nor to you. David commits a really, really serious sin. He he gives in. The giving in is when he calls her from the rooftop. I mean, that's, that starts the whole chain. Um, these sins are not 
And they're, 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 not, they're, they're not accidental. Uh, I mean, well, I should say they're not accidental. Um, if anybody follows the business news, these past few months, there have been a lot of, of, of big business executives who have resigned their positions because they violated that seventh commandment as well. And in reading about some of these, some of these people were indeed people of faith who many times would have said, and lead us not into temptation. And I think the point I want to make is this, is if that's what we really pray, pray is lead us not into temptation, those prayers aren't answered. Time of trial. Um, we have to look, I think, at the historical context in which the New Testament, including the Gospel according to Matthew, which would have been written after 2 Corinthians, is written. Christians were being persecuted, and some were even being, if you know, thrown into the ring to die. They had the time of trial. Christians were being asked, do you renounce your faith, or are you going to die? That is the real time of trial. None of us here are facing that test. But there are Christians around the world, even today, who face that test. That proclaiming their faith <coughs> can cause them to lose their lives. But, 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 but we don't have to. But my point is, is I believe what we are asking in the Lord's Prayer is that we be spared the challenge or the temptation of denouncing our faith because Christianity is simply too hard to live out. You know, I, 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 I think I can say with confidence that no one here has committed or will commit murder. But I can say with at least statistical certainty that some of us have, or even at this point will, commit the sin of adultery. We will realize that we have violated one of the basic tenets of our Christian faith. But whether, well, we, we, we failed the pop quiz in that examination, but have we lost all? It's a tough one, but I think the answer is an unequivocal no. We have not lost all. Now, as we go on in the story of David, it, it's amazing. It takes time. He doesn't realize he's committed a sin, believe it or not. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to a story where the, pro, the prophet Nathan tells him his, his, a parable that allows David to realize that, that, that he has sinned. And Chris, this is a very old-fashioned sexist parable. That he sinned against Uriah, not because he killed him, but because he had adultery with Uriah's wife. Okay. And David repents. David repents. And my point ultimately is this. We have one of the most sordid stories in the Bible that we have just read today. It is a story of, of a very human man who sins worse than most of us would ever do. And yet, and yet, God still loves David. If God could love David despite David's sins, then God can love each of us. God, we, 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 we pray that, that we will be spared the time of trial. We, we, we would love to, to, to miss temptation. That's not true, is it? Do any of us really not want to be tempted? But do any of us want to have to choose between our faith and our lives? That's the time of trial. And do we, have, do we ever want to choose that, oh my goodness, because I've sinned so badly, I better just deny my religion? We, we have a God who says, I love David despite his sins. I'll continue to love you despite yours. And so, oh God, we do pray that we indeed be spared as much temptation as possible 
but that if we yield, that we recognize our sinfulness, come to you in repentance, because we know, God, that as you love David, so you loved us, and through Jesus Christ, have forgiven us our sins. His name.